we have quite a few people in the audience tonight, so we're going to allow another 30 seconds or so, so we can allow our colleagues to file in. Well, good evening, colleagues and friends. Welcome to tonight's lecture on the psychology of race and racism. And thank you to Alex Petersey and our esteemed speakers for inviting us into tonight's conversation. This is the Institute for the Study of Race and Culture's inaugural annual lecture. And we are grateful to you, our audience members, for spending the time to join us and to participate in this essential work and all that it demands of us. This lecture series has as its hope the desire to be a platform for esteemed scholars to expand our understanding of the function and processes associated with racism, and in turn, provide insights for how psychologists and educators can participate in the disruption and dismantling of racial oppression. The stated mission of the Boston College's Lynch School of Education and Human Development indeed includes enhancing the human condition and making the world more just. As such, the Institute for the Study of Race and Culture with its focus on understanding the effects of racism and contributing to knowledge for intervention, plays an important role in assisting the school to fulfill its stated mission. As the Associate Dean of Strategic Initiatives and External Relations, I'm delighted to welcome you to this inaugural event and introduce this evening's presenters. But before I introduce Dr. Liu and Dr. Neville, I would like to convey apologies from Dr. Alex Petersey, Director of the Institute, who due to a recent COVID diagnosis is unable to introduce and moderate this evening. So you're stuck with me for the night. I'd like to uh, first though acknowledge as we get started the enormous contributions of Dr. Janet Helms, who both founded and directed the Institute formerly known as the Institute for the Study and Promotion of Race and Culture over the past 20 years here at the Lynch School. I know that Dr. Peter C is keen to build on the contribution of Dr. Helms' work and continue the Institute's rich history of bringing scholars and practitioners together to further discuss and explore critical issues of race and racism in today's society. So the structure of the evening's program is gonna take the following shape. We'll begin with Dr. Liu's lecture, followed by Dr. Neville's response. And after this, we'll open it up to the audience engagement. And we're gonna use the Q&A function on your screen in order to do that. We'll explain that further as we get closer. But now I have the privilege of introducing our esteemed speakers. Dr. William Ming Liu, is Professor of Counseling Psychology and Department Chair at the University of Maryland. His research interests are in social class and classism, men and masculinity, and white supremacy and privilege. He has received leadership awards from the Committee on Socioeconomic Status from the APA, the Society of the, of the Psych Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity and Race, and the Society for the Psychological Study of Men and Masculinities. In 2022, he received the Janet E. Helms Award for the mentoring and scholarship from the Winter Roundtable Teachers College, Columbia University. He's an editor and co-editor of many books that are recognized as key texts in their respective fields. And he has a forthcoming book titled Systems of White Supremacy and White Privilege, a Racial Spatial Framework for Psychology out of Oxford University Press. Really happy to have you here tonight. Dr. Helen A. Neville is a professor of educational psychology and African-American studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is past president of the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, Ethnicity, and Race, and a fellow of the American Psychological Association. She's active in the Association of Black Psychologists, having served on their board of directors and received their Distinguished Psychologist Award. Her research on race, racism, and African-American psychology has been published in wide-ranging journal articles, and she has co-edited eight books in this area. She enjoys teaching, lifelong learning, and fighting for social justice. Really happy to have you here as well. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to you now, Dr. Liu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share my screen here and we'll get started. 
Um, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to um, be the speaker, um, be the inaugural speaker for this, um, uh, for the Institute. And uh, I want to thank the Institute for the Study of Race and Culture and Dr. Pichersi for inviting me to present. I also want to thank Dr. Neville for serving as the discussant um, for this presentation. And I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're going to be having at the end of the um, presentation. I also want to note that um, because of um, the topic that we're talking about today, which is on space and on the racial framing of systemic racism, it's important for us to, and important for me to provide a land acknowledgement from the place that I'm presenting from, which is the from uh, Maryland. And so the land acknowledgement it reflects uh, the space that I'm in. I'm going to read the land acknowledgement and then we'll take a pause um, before we get started with the rest of the presentation. So every community owes its existence and strength to the generations before them around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy into making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to migrate from their homes in hopes of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgments are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and difference. We acknowledge the truth that is often buried. We are on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people who were for, among the first in the Western hemisphere. We are on indigenous land that was stolen from the Piscataway people by European colonists. We pay respects to the Piscataway elders and ancestors. So please let us take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us here today. The topic um, I'm gonna be presenting about today is on systemic racism. It's a framework uh, uh, that, I'll, that we call the racial spatial framework for systemic racism. <clears throat> and in the discussion that we're having um, that will that we'll uh, have today. Uh, I just want to provide this caution because I know that some of the conversation that we'll be having, because this is focused on the traumas around racism, especially around systemic racism and the way that we, uh, my colleagues and I have framed it, uh, some of the discussion can, can be rather, um, uh, Kurt can be rather um, straightforward. And so I want to just make this cautionary note for those of us who are listening in and participating in this presentation that the discussion can be rather frank because we're talking about the impact and the consequences of systemic racism on people's lives, beat the lives of people of color. So the goals for today, one of which I want to start with, which is that um, my positionality is a cisgendered heterosexual Asian American man who's the son of Robert and Judy who's the spouse of Racina and the father of Bella Rose. And the challenge that I have today is to present a framework, a racial spatial framework in terms of how we wanna understand systemic racism. So it's a sort of a big task. And my job hopefully is to be able to do it in such a manner and such a time that uh, we'll have a time for a conversation and, to, and a time for um, Dr. Neville to present as well. One of the things that uh, was important to myself as well as my colleagues as we developed this framework was that we wanted to try to look at the literature around uh, from the experiences of people of color and how they talked about their experiences with racism. And so the, for me, one of the ways that I describe it in terms of uh, understanding this framework of systemic racism is making sure that this framework is in close dialogue with the scholars of color who are doing the research around uh, race, racism, uh, gendered racism as well, uh, intersectionality, all those aspects and all the theories and all the research that scholars of color are producing. It was really important that, that the framework that we developed was, like I said, in close dialogue, that it made sense uh, in terms of helping us better understand the framework and the background related to um, systemic racism. So one of my jobs today uh, in terms of the presentation is to also explain the components of our racial spatial framework, which is racial capitalism, white supremacy, and anti-blackness as well. And 
a lot of uh, what I'm presenting today comes from our in-press journal of counseling psychology um, article, as well as our forthcoming book um, and uh, current research projects that I'm doing with my colleagues that looks at the experiences of white spaces uh, from a qualitative standpoint, but also in the pursuit of developing a measure and a couple of other manuscripts that we are uh, currently uh, working on as well. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, one of the things that I wanted to try to understand in terms of systemic racism to look at uh, ways that things that are happening happening around us that are uh, in and of itself strike me as um, racist of uh, outcomes of systemic racism, but. Uh, for psychologists might have, we sometimes have a difficult time sort of pinpointing and trying to understand what is going on. And so let me pull a story from a recent, um, a current uh, situation that's happening in Mason, uh, Tennessee, which is a population of 1300 people, 72% uh, of which uh, whom are black and African American, and 23% uh, are white. And um, up until 2016, the small town was run by a white mayor and city council. And in 2016, that white mayor uh, and the city council uh, resigned in mass in part because they they were found to have mismanaged the resources of the um, of the town. Um, and like I said, it's a predominantly black uh, town of Mason, Tennessee, but it's located in a predominantly white Tipton County, 78% white. And for the most part, the town was off the radar for, um, uh, for Tennessee uh, state government. Uh, it, was a, it was a town that was run mostly by uh, Blacks uh, municipal government at that time until, of course, uh, Ford, uh, the Ford company decided to build a new $5.6 billion electric car plant nearby about five miles up the road from um, Mason, Tennessee. So as you might imagine, what happened was it suddenly became evident that Mason, Tennessee became a valuable property, a valuable space that, um, that uh, was important for, for uh, not only the county, but also for the state. It became so important that uh, the comptroller, Jason Mumpower, announced that, the, that uh, he was going to, as a agent of the state take take over financially the governing of the town um, and his accusation was that uh, that the city the town had a history of financial mismanagement didn't matter when it happened who it was uh, who caused it um, but he looked at the history of it and said that the the town had a history of financial management and therefore he wanted to dissolve the city charter which meant that Mason, Tennessee would cease to exist and it would blend into the larger Tipton County. And this is the vice mayor as well as the mayor standing next to Jason Mumpower. And just in case you don't know who Jason Mumpower is here, I'm just going to highlight Jason Mumpower here in the slide. And part of the restrictions, because the dissolving of the city charter didn't go through, Jason Mumpower went in and said that this city of Mason could not pay any bills more than $100, which was about 95% of the work that the city government did, which is everything over $100. It also, they also put the city, the city, the town of Mason, Tennessee, on a repayment plan of about $10,000 a month, and that they had to prove by this summer that they could manage the finances of uh, the town. And um, this is a picture of them meeting and discussion uh, about the city charter as well as the financial uh, management of the city. And at present, the NAACP uh, has provided legal counsel to and represented the um, city as a part of the, um, the fight to resist Mumpower's takeover of the, of the town. So <clears throat> as psychologists, as a counseling psychologist, how do we understand what's going on in Mason, Tennessee? So how does psychology conceptualize this uh, beyond just the individual acts of racism, right? Beyond just individual 
actors of racism in this context? How do we understand this? Uh, how do we label it? What kind of racism is this? What is happening? But also, why is it happening as well? And how is systemic racism a part of this analysis? How do we make it a meaningful part of this analysis? For me as well, in terms of my framing of uh, the within the racial spatial framework of uh, systemic racism, I'm also wanting. Uh, I'm also interested in understanding how does white supremacy, how is white supremacy implicated in this uh, current situation? How is racial capitalism uh, related to how we understand what's going on? How is this relevant to anti-blackness? And for me, related to this also is how is white time relevant in our analysis too? And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment in terms of helping us understand what white time what what white time means within this particular um, context. So uh, one of the things that I turn to is tr in trying to understand um, the aspects of systemic racism uh, is to draw upon our current research and our current theories and uh, try to place this particular uh, situation within a uh, context, right? And so Turning to something like the 2000, 2017 multicultural guidelines that were produced by APA, uh, in, in those multicultural guidelines, they adapted Bronfenbrenner as a means to understand systemic racism, right? So this is Bronfenbrenner's chart. I think most of us have a sense of what the, what the chart is, as well as the concentric circles that represent the different uh, ecosystems. And what's clear here in terms of, and what's really also important to understand in terms of Bronfenbrenner's um, ecological systems theory is that um, in adapting it to understand systemic racism, we also have to remember that this particular theory is a theory of white child development. And I wanna make sure that we understand that this is white, chi it's white child development. Now, he doesn't label it as the white child, it's the ubiquitous, child that is represented within the system. And so uh, the system operates in a manner that is predictable and linear with respect to its effect on the white child. Um, that uh, if something happens, let's say in the macro system, that there's a predictable linear way in which uh, it cascades across the different systems onto the child. That's the expected way that the, that the ecological systems theory is supposed to operate. Um, the other piece that is apparent as well as, we, as I was doing this uh, research is that there, there are no ideologies explicated in um, the ecological systems theory. And so in terms of using it as a way to understand systemic racism, that's one of the components that's, um, that's missing. But you know, if we think about it as the white child as the center and the society operating in a way that protects and nurtures and cultivates the child, especially the white child, then we can see this is an idealized, optimized system for a child. And it, is, it may be inaccurate and it may be um, problematic simply to put a child of color, a black child in the center without really understanding what's going on within the different systems. Uh, this, is, this particular model, this particular theory is not a context that reflects racism. It doesn't centralize race as a way to understand how these different systems operate. So one of the things that happens is that if it doesn't centralize race as a feature to understand systemic racism, then what happens is when you put racism or some kind of effect within that system, it, it becomes under theorized. In other words, racism, uh, as we understand it within this particular sort of white framework, um, becomes under theorized. We sort of underestimate the impact, the systemic impact of racism on the individual. That's what I mean by under theorized. And so we might think about it as potentially being uh, misapplied using the ecological system theory as being misapplied with respect to trying to understand systemic racism. And so there is a need 
to conceptualize systemic racism that centralizes how we understand race, how we understand racism from these multiple scholars and researchers of color and writers and artists who talked about racism in different ways. How do we centralize it and then build a model, potentially a framework to try to understand systemic racism? So for me, one of the things that is important in terms of understanding systemic racism is really um, uh, uh, in all the literature that we've read and what, uh, the literature that I've read, the literature sort of fell into three um, big um, areas. Uh, one of which, and I'll go through these definitions uh, quickly, most of us sort of understand uh, a lot of these definitions already, is um, certainly white supremacy is a big, it has to be a central ideological feature within systemic racism. It's the beliefs and subsequent practices um, to ensure the superiority of whiteness and white people uh, and white culture. Racial capitalism also is an important feature as well because racial capitalism speaks to specifically the exploitation of people of color, their spaces, their labor, their time, and directs that exploitation to create profits for particularly white capitalists. When we think about racial capitalism as well, it's specific, uh, specifically capitalism, we really have to think about it. Uh, we also have to understand that the principal component of capitalism is ownership of property. And that it can be real property, it can be geographic land as a form of property, and it serves as the foundation of wealth. It still exists and still persists as the foundation of wealth. Related to racial capitalism as well, is we have to understand that capitalism is not distributive. Capitalism is a focus on hoarding and accumulation, right? It is about constantly gaining, constantly pulling in. There's no moral or ethical guideline or framework that says capitalism has to be shared. You know, it's in many ways, it's sort of counter to some of the econ 101, um, uh, courses that you might have taken that, you know, there's some benefits to competition where you develop um, better products and the prices go down. Uh, that's an intermediary step. The reality is, is most capitalists, the people who are owners of businesses, the capitalists, um, don't, don't care about competition. In fact, they want to eliminate competition, right? So if we didn't have certain laws in place, we would have major monopolies, which we still do and we do have those monopolies so the focus is on eliminating competition that competition can be businesses competition can be people competition can be community so eliminating competition is also a principal component within capitalism when i speak of capitalism too i want us to constantly remember that we're really talking about racial capitalism that it's um, that race and racism are central features in the way that our economy operates. It is the structuring of racial economic inequality is a key function within um, how our economy uh, operates. Another piece related to it too is that within capitalism that there are metrics and there are accounting, right? So that are paramount, that are tied to how we um, talk about white profit. In other words, the amount of time it takes to produce something, the amount of time it takes to sell something, the amount of time it takes to get um, profits back is related to hoarding accumulation and related to how you uh, talk about uh, wealth as well. Accounting here is really the application of numbers, the application of categorization, the application of ways of sorting um, as a means to also create profit. So numbers, metrics, these metrics, numbers and time become principal ways that we start to understand how exploitation occurs within racial capitalism. And also anti-Blackness, <coughs> excuse me, um, is a central feature as well within uh, this framework of uh, the racial spatial framework of uh, systemic racism. It is simply, the dehumanization of Black people. Um, and part of the anti-Blackness is that it erases Black success. And 
it erasing black success is as important as guaranteeing <coughs> um, success for white people. So even if they're in a situation, there's no explicit gain for white people uh, within that space. It's also it's also important to make sure that there are no gains at all for black communities in that space as well. So erasing, eliminating, depressing black success, economic, especially economic success is as important within uh, anti-blackness. And uh, Alex turned us to this article that we uh, cited pretty heavily within our GCP article about Bledsoe and Wright that um, where they talk about this idea of black a spatiality and simply meaning that uh, wherever black people, black communities, black families are within particular white spaces, um, they're almost invisible um, to the general needs within that particular white space or the white economy at that in that time. So um, even if they have a thriving community, they can be dispossessed, dislocated, and displaced um, at any time that they're that they're um, they do represent a kind of a spatiality. So the model that we came up with was this, and I'll give you a second here in case you want to take a picture of it with your phone so you can use it. We'll come back to it in a second uh, as we look at it. But um, this is the model, this is the framework that we produced um, um, in terms of trying to understand the functions of a racial spatial framework for uh, a systemic racism. So, In our model, in our framework of systemic racism, one of the things that's really important for us to re constantly remember is that within this framework, because it's systemic racism, we really have to focus on the application of power that is asymmetric. That's not balanced. It's always going to be asymmetric towards whiteness, towards the benefit of white supremacy. So it's all what we talk about as racial asymmetric power. Right? There's no symmetry, there's no balance, there's no, uh, there's no um, expectation of sharing of power, so it's always asymmetric. As you can see in the model, it's an enclosed system, which means that as a, you know, as a system of system, as a, uh, a framework of systemic racism, it's enclosed and has to be self-sustaining. It also reproduces itself, right? The, the integrity of the system uh, maintains its ideological and original purposes, but just evolves. Um, scholars have talked about it as white supremacy, for instance, being a, a scavenger ideology. It just constantly grabs onto things that continues to make it relevant, perpetuate itself, but hides itself as well simultaneously. So um, it helps us understand that uh, when we talk about the, the permanence of systemic racism, even though it feels like things have evolved or things have changed, the principal components of systemic racism still exist. As I talked about earlier, it's ideologically justified and legitimized and rationalized. White supremacy, racial capitalism, and anti-Blackness serve as those ideological functions. It also has to be materially, materially rewarding, and those can be psychological rewards as, as well as real material benefits, right? So they're physical, actual manifested rewards, as well as psychological rewards. I'm sorry, excuse me. And within the system, it constantly differentiates actors within the system. In other words, it constantly discriminates uh, as a function of categorizing, just dis discriminates between actors. And that's a way to maintain inequality and equity. And one of the ways that that happens on an almost everyday basis is through what we Describe as surveillance and policing that continually perpetuates uh, differentiation and inequality. And so for us, when we talk about systemic racism within this racial spatial framework, what we come to understand is one of the quintessential outcomes, one of the quintessential experiences of many people of color is dispossession, displacement, and dislocation, as well as exploitation simply based on race dispossession, displacement, and dislocation and exploitation simply based on race. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. 
and also time as a function of racism. It's also used as a way that we understand uh, racism. So here we go back to the uh, framework that we um, uh, created. You can see surveillance and policing, um, the ideological components at the top, and the differentiation it creates at the, towards the bottom as well. Excuse me. So one of the things that we have to understand too between, is uh, um, that there, uh, the difference between white space and white property. They, all spaces within the continental US, and I'm talking about the US context here, is certainly stolen territory and geography that you can't understand it um, aside, from other, aside from the fact that it was stolen, right? So this primitive accumulation of land and property is the foundation in, for capital wealth. It always has been, um, and it is the thing that people, uh, white people fight over in terms of preserving. All white property is within white space, but not all white space is regarded as white property. When we start to talk about property as a function, what we're really talking about is taking a particular white space and making it profitable, right? Making it um, uh, wealth creative, right? And so an open space that has nothing built on it is white space. Um, it still is white space because uh, we live in a subtle colonial um, uh, nation. So it represents white space. But the moment it starts to move towards white property, that's where we start to see investment um, of, uh, of uh, institutional powers uh, in the creation of that property. White spaces and white property are certainly critical because for many white people, uh, uh, we would argue this is where their white identity is formed and constantly reformed through the pra practices that they engage in in these white spaces. These white spaces are protected. Um, these white spaces are normalized for uh, white behaviors. And these practices for many white people allow them to see themselves um, uh, being free, right? They see themselves as being able to move in and out of different spaces, um, that they shouldn't be restricted. And these physical practices then allow them the sense that they also are entitled to enter into other spaces as well, as well as feeling entitled to do things that they otherwise um, might be restricted from. And so White spaces and white property are important places where identity is formed and reformed. And so when, as I was talking about before, and if you think back about Mason, Tennessee, the movement between white spaces and white property um, and the implementation of white property rights is where we really start to see the demonstration of institutional power come into play. So in this case for Mason, Tennessee, we start to see the government the governmental process come into play in terms of trying to uh, pull back and um, uh, reclaim this particular property uh, for white property. It is the movement of capital, as I was talking about, the monies, it's the form of investment now that they want to put back into Mason, Tennessee. But previous to that, a form of divestment, they moved out of that and because of the di that divestment, they were no longer interested in Mason until the Ford uh, Motor uh, Company decided to build something uh, near Mason. And as I was saying before, what we're going to likely see is the displacement, dispossession, and dislocation of those Black residents within Mason, Tennessee. I can almost guarantee that um, when, if the state government were to be um, successful in erasing Mason, Tennessee, the Black residents in Mason, Tennessee are going to be displaced. And one of the things that's going to start to happen is that they're going to certainly be excluded as a beneficiary of all the economic gains that are coming from the Ford, Ford um, Motor Company uh, plant that's coming. And what we're also going to start to see is the institutional powers are going to start to build roads and structures and strip malls and other things where uh, it feeds and benefits the largely white population within that, um, within that uh, space 
uh, while constantly my constantly moving and marginalizing the black community members into other marginal spaces and in a few years what we'll likely be able to do uh, see if it all goes in the direction of jason mumpower is that we will see strip malls and other things that benefit mostly white uh, communities and off into some other area you're going to be able to point and say that's where the black community is because these racist structures physical structures are going to be built to differentiate between the groups and the right the property rights are also important to understand because the property rights are not just about ownership it's not just about saying um who owns the property it also uh, property rights are are critical in terms of understanding that um who owns the property is also tied to this notion of sovereignty and i don't want to get too abstract here but the notion of sovereignty really goes back to these old Roman rules about how, what kind of power does one have over their property? And um, so they can do whatever they want with it. Um, it gives them free reign to make sure that they can exploit that uh, property as much as possible. And sovereignty also means that they can discard with that property any way that they want as well. And so sovereignty and property rights are very much aligned. And while we don't talk about, um, the uh, um, the other problems related to sovereignty, it is certainly tied into how uh, people can use their property. So um, one of the things I just want to talk about uh, as well is um, one of the things that you'll notice is that we pulled in white time very close to uh, white spaces. and. Uh, for us, in terms of thinking about systemic racism, time as an experience as a person of color, and also from the literature that we've read as well, white time is often used to regulate the lives of people of color within white spaces. And white time has always been used as a form of aggression and violence against Black and other non-Black people um, in terms of differential incarceration rates, in terms of the outcome, that we see um, it impacting health, um, the longevity, the lifespans, as well as gestational periods for Black and other non-Black community members. Um, there's also the, um, the notion of, for many uh, communities of color, the, the recognition of the longevity of racism, sort of the racial realistic approach to understanding systemic racism that has been around for a long time and somewhat permanent versus a sort of a white racial framework of racial progressivism. And when we think about the anti-CRT movements that many states are seeing right now, anti-CRT movements are a direct extension of racial progressivism because racial progressivism says um, racism is stopped because of, you know, pick your favorite moment in history that represented some uh, exemplar of a success by some exceptional person of color. And therefore, because of that, racism is, in fact, ended. And so that's an example of racial progressivism. And the anti-CRT movement is clearly related to that. Um, and so through time, through this imposition of artificial time frames, for instance, as we think back about Mason, Tennessee, racism creates instability, unpredictable, unpredictability, and a level of chaos, right? So you can imagine if you're the mayor and the vice mayor and the and the city government, you suddenly have all this imposition of these time frames. And imagine the instability and the chaos it creates in terms of trying to revamp everything uh, to try to meet these artificial time frames, right? And so we describe it as a kind of time theft. You know, the time, the actual time it takes away in the lives of people of color to adjust or to adapt to new expectations and demands. That's one example of it, but there are lots of other examples of time theft that can happen in many people of color's lives. And also a much more subtle form of, of white racial time, which is uh, uh, this notion of allochronism. And it's a little bit more subtle, but it certainly is also um, certainly um, apparent within this particular racial spatial framework, which is really this idea that black and non-black people of color um, are less evolved right, uh, that they're not a different species, that's a form of dehumanizations, but they are certainly just less evolved, which is kind of this idea of infrahumanization. One of the outcomes of this idea of allochronism or the idea that 
Black and non-Black people of color and communities of color are less evolved. For instance, as an example of Black children, for instance, being seen as too big or aggressive and sexual when compared to white children of their same age. <clears throat> and a result of this belief that uh, Black and non-Black people are less evolved is that um, they're seen as less intelligent, prone to dirtiness, and they can't experience human emotion or pain. So things that we want to sort of keep in mind as we move into this uh, using the racial spatial framework is that white supremacy, anti-Blackness, racial capitalism are always operating. Asymmetric power is constantly applied. White space and white time are central. They, they, they create the energy that drives the entire system. Surveillance and policing are constantly operating within uh, systemic racism as a way to protect the white spaces, but also to con constantly differentiate between actors within the system. And the outcome differentiates between exploited and those explo uh, being exploited. And the conceptualization of systemic racism allows us to derive questions as well as research questions, as well as connect how we understand individual levels of racism within a larger conceptual framework of systemic racism. So um, within the framework here, one of the things that um, I've highlighted here is that within, when we try to understand Mason, Tennessee, um, this, is, this is one example of how this um, framework might operate. We see the movement between white property and property rights and the change between white space and the creation of white property. And so using the RSF as a conceptual, conceptualization of systemic racism and using that language to sort of help us provide the context and the background of it, we might come up with this particular kind of conceptualization. The white property is divested in 2016, currently the site of white government, which is a power governor in connection with white business, Ford, which is another power governor, to dispossess and displace the black and municipal government of their positions and to erase the city by dissolving the city charter. So it becomes part of a larger county, which is an example of black spatiality. Carceral language is used to, used to describe the financial mismanagement and to imply that Black mayor is incapable of financial complexity. As a means to meet this goal, they're surveilling and policing the Black mayor and city council by limiting how much they can spend and limiting what they can do in terms of their governmental duties. And they're also facing an artificial time frame. Uh, ultimately, the goal of the comptroller, comptroller is to reclaim this now valuable valuable white space and property for the inequitable um, benefit of white people within the state. So um, what can we know about racism and how we might study it? And so here are some questions that sort of, um, or some conclusions that we can come to, um, that they would rather dissolve the town charter rather than support Mason. Um, what? And uh, in terms of a psychological approach, you know, what kind of research questions might we derive from that conclusion that they would rather dissolve the town charter rather than support Mason? Or racism is disguised through procedural language. Racism has a time element related to it as well, right? Racism has a surveillance and policing component. And racism, uh, the outcome and the effect of systemic racism within the RSF is that it creates wealth that's directly related uh, for white people while dispossessing black residents uh, and in effect reducing and eliminating economic competition, i.e. dissolving uh, Mason, Tennessee. And so I'll end it here by just asking us to think about using the RSF with other um, kinds of large contextual systemic uh, examples of systemic racism. You know, we have Flint, Michigan, we have Ferguson, we have the US-Mexico border, we have Standing Rock, we have more recent examples that came out in the papers uh, about Black-owned homes being appraised for less value, which is a form of systemic racism, right? And we should know that because it helps us understand the context uh, in which um, um, communities of color and people of color are uh, living in, they're trying to, uh, that they're experiencing within systemic racism. 
So um, for us, one of the things that I would ask us to do is when we think about um, uh, theorizing the importance of systemic racism, we have to provide a better context, a better frame. So we, you know, when we write papers or we um, talk about a predominantly white institution, for instance, for those of us who are working on college campuses, we have to do a better job of really providing a more nuanced, much more uh, elaborate, uh, theoretically cogent understanding of what it means when we say predominantly white institution. We don't want to use it as a throwaway term that means a lot of different things. We want to sort of bring it into a coherent whole. We also want to provide a context where we can understand how psychological research can be connected to understanding this larger systemic racist uh, context. And it allows us to better situate our uh, qualitative and uh, quantitative findings. So I want to stop it there. And I think I uh, made it just on time so that uh, uh, we have plenty of time for Dr. Neville to uh, provide um, some commentary and we'll have some Q&A. So thank you. I think I'll stop sharing now. Um, and that we can just go back to the group. Oh, wow. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, before I talk about my comments, I want to, there are several people I want to acknowledge and thank. Um, first of all, thank you to Dr. Janet Helms, for her vision over 20 years ago in creating the Institute. It has been such a gift to our field, um, to um, psychology and education. Um, second, I wanna congratulate Dr. Alex Petersey on his new directorship of this Institute. And it's wonderful to see that an academic grandchild of Dr. Helms is assuming the mantle and he's already off to a great start um, and thank him for the kind invitation. And last but not least, I wanna thank Dr. William Liu for this outstanding presentation and gift that you've bestowed to the field. Um, Dr. Liu and I go way back where we did some, I would say trauma bonding over a decade ago when we were part of the National Multicultural Conference um, and Summit coordinating team. So it's fun to see your work and how it's taken on many, many different directions. I'm not looking at the chat right now, but I know there's chat functions. And I just want to know if we can give some love um, in the chat and to Dr. Liu for his amazing presentation. I'm curious uh, to see um, what struck you most about his remarks and his presentation. So my comments today will focus on what was said in the presentation as well as the JCP paper in which Dr. Liu talked about, which is gonna be a must read paper. It's coming out in a special issue in the Journal of Counseling Psychology that is committed to structural racism and anti-Black racism, edited by Drs. Matt Miller, um, Alex Petersey, and Gioni Lewis. So I'm gonna highlight some things that struck with me and what I see as the important strengths of the work. I'm, um, what you presented is incredibly dense and really hard to digest um, for a first read, second read, but I'll give my try a little bit there. And then I'm gonna turn my attention to some alternative ways to think about the proposed model and what psychologists can do. And it has, no, I mean, it's just, you know, the model's already so complete. I had to come up with something though. Um, one, I really appreciate um, Dr. Liu, you um, and then um, your colleagues in the paper um, centering the interdisciplinary Black American scholarship. Many times that is erased. And so one of the things that you had started your presentation with is a goal of staying close and in dialogue with Black, Indigenous, and other people of color scholars and the work that they're doing in this area. And I think that you really achieve that goal, particularly with Black Black scholars. So by doing this, you explicitly address the epistemic erasure and violence in our field and other fields. 
So for those um, folks who, um, when you read the article, you'll know that they include scholars such as political scientist, um, Cedric Robinson, um, really in terms of drawing on his work on racial capitalism, novelist and essayist, Toni Morrison's work on white imagination and legal scholars such as Cheryl Harris's work on whiteness as property and Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality. So that was really important as well as uplifting and highlighting some counseling psychologists work such as Thomas Parham, Tama Bryant Davis. So centering that scholarship and seeing how black scholars and what they have to say, I think is incredibly important. So thank you for doing that. I like this idea of this racial spatial systemic racism. And I do think that's a gift. It's a sophisticated way to understand the multidimensional nature of systemic racism and the ways in which ideologies or these larger thoughts and ideas, practices and political econ uh, economy create and reinforce anti-Black racism. Um, so I think that is incredibly important. This inclusion of space and time is under theorized, it's novel and it's important um, consideration. It also provides a way for counseling psychology to inform, um, uh, to not only inform, but to situate the importance of our thinking and work and how it can um, disrupt complex social systems. You know, we can work within others. Many times people um, ignore and erase the field of counseling psychology and the work that we do. And I think this is a nice contribution um, there. I don't know about others, but when you were listening, whether you thought the uh, uh, allochronism, I mean, that was a new term for me, but it did remind me of some of the work, earlier work, say, of folks like um, Gloria Latson Billings. And she's got this uh, incredible article about they're trying to wash us away, really focusing, looking at critical race theory and education um, um, in terms of Hurricane Katrina. And what I like so much about this concept is it allows us an opportunity to think about the ways in which I'm gonna particularly focus my uh, comments on black folks because of the anti-blackness -black that is in the model, but the, it denies black folks a historical being. And in the article, you unpack that a bit more. It's, it's as if our history starts with um, slavery or the slave trade or starts with this. It's as if our history starts when white people interact with us. And then by being ahistorical that way, then it doesn't allow us to have these victories in certain ways or culture that stands outside of Europeans and whiteness. So I think that's really interesting. And in a way then it erases our humanity. And in the Mason example that you provide, um, the, the white time, the way that I really see that it also works is when they arbitrarily decide about when they're going to start thinking about the mismanagement. Uh, and even though it's with white folks, they're going to attribute it to black folks. So I think that was, I really think that's a, a beautiful way of, of kind of conceptualizing that. Also this notion of time as this is not necessarily what you were going to do, um, um, talk about it, but it also hits home because it's, it, it's connected to this concept of racial capitalism, right? In essence, not only is this white time, but it's capitalist time. It's time in which time in, in this way is time is money. You do this for time. And so this conceptualization, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and there's other ways to kind of think about time, even literally the concept of time is different for many people, right? All the way from what is a new year, what is, uh, um, whether the clock actually represents the way the time of indigenous people think about things, indigenous in North America, Africa, other places. Time in other contexts is connected to the land time in European and white context is connected to outside of land, but in terms of reproducing and being productive in terms of making money. So I think that you it opens up a whole range of um, kind of things. I have some other notes on this, but I think I'm going for time. I'm going to go to some other things and I might uh, turn back to that. 
In terms of some of the alternatives, tweaks, and considerations that I wanted to just chat about, so I really appreciated the inclusion of racial capitalism, um, and I think that is so important. Um, but an alternative way to think about this racial spatial systemic racism is to really center racial capitalism in the paradigm. So it's not we're talking about systemic racism, we're talking about this is all a product of racial capitalism. So systemic racism is an outgrowth of, you know, of uh, racial capitalism. White supremacy is the ideology that's used to support racial capitalism. So it's kind of centering a couple of other things that would be taking more of a political economy point of view versus another. And I really think I like in terms of the way that Robin Kelly thinks about, um, describes Cedric Robinson's work um, and others is like, it's capitalism and racism, this is a quote for him, did not break from the old order, but rather evolved from it to produce a modern world system of racial capitalism. So I think this allows us a different paradigm. Um, in terms of like the Mason County example, the ways in which the centering of racial capitalism would work would be to really think about who stands to profit from this. So my sense is these companies are probably, um, you talk about the state and other things, but these companies are probably are, um, trying to advocate for that. So how do they profit from this takeover and who loses out? And so it's not just the county and the state, but potentially, the um, the the company, this multi-billion dollar company, because we're talking about labor exploitation laws, we're talking about probably environmental, there could be tax breaks, there's all kinds of things. So in order for capitalism to work, they need to exploit workers, um, the environment, they need white workers to buy into this system. So they let them know that they're better than black workers and they set up this ideology to justify this exploitation or this army of kind of surplus labor black folks. So I, which are the residents. So I, I, I really liked at the end how you're talking about, so what's going to happen to these residents, right? What, um, what event? And I, I would be really curious to see if um, not only crime rates go up, but if in um, incarceration goes up, because we know with, if you're taking more of the racial capitalism lens, we know that there's this reserve army of labor. What happens when you don't have enough jobs for a certain class of people, then you create new systems or new jobs. So we don't have enough jobs for poor black people. So what do we do? We have the prison industrial complex, right? Which creates jobs for white people to profit off of the racism. So I, I just would be really curious. And I think your model is flexible to kind of consider that. Um, how, then the other thing, I, I liked that you included um, settler colonialism. I think that makes a lot of sense. And so that got me also thinking, how can the model further include the experiences of Black folks. Um, and so in addition to settler colonialism, which applies more to indigenous folks, what would apply to Black folks? And I think the idea of internal colonialism. So we're really thinking about Blahner's work, where all the systems that you, you talked about, unequal access to resources, increasing um, dependency, looking at cheap labor, creating kind of segregation, all of that is this internal colonial um, thesis where we have, um, you know, a second, third class kind of class structures for people of color. And I think that would be a really interesting paradigm. There was some really interesting article by um, that was in uh, by Mary um, Texaria that talks about policing internal um, uh, colonialism, slavery, Rodney King, that really connects all of these dots that you're talking about. And um, so I thought that was really interesting and would connect more to this anti-Blackness as well. But your model is already so complex. Then I got to really thinking about, in addition to what you've said, you know, what, how, where do psychologists feel? And I like how you are encouraging psychologists to think broadly, to think about systems and structures. And I do think we need to do much more of that. 
and maybe I'm feeling protective, I also don't think we need to abandon some of our strengths that we get trained as, as counseling psychology in terms of individual, interpersonal, and group stuff. And so in your work, you talk about, um, and in the presentation, um, you talk about the, the benefits that white people have materially and psychologically. Um, and Du Bois talks about this experience as the wages of whiteness. And there's two right dimensions of that. There's a psychological dimension, and then there's a material dimension. Uh, just for those people who don't know, I'm gonna read a real quick quote. This is from his 1935 book, Black Reconstruction in America. It must be remembered that the white group of laborers, while they received a low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference and titles of courtesy because they were white. They were admitted freely with all classes of white people to public functions, public parks, and the best schools. The police were drawn um, from their ranks and their courts, um, dependent on their votes, treated them with such leniency as to encourage lawlessness. I mean, we could think about this written now, which is almost, you know, even though this was written almost 100 years ago. Um, so then that, you know, so I'd like to really unpack what you started this conversation on these wages of whiteness, but the psychological component. Because I think what happens is there are sociologists and other people talking about the psych psychological point, uh, point of wages of whiteness and psychologists um, can contribute to that. Um, in the article, you talk about these counter narratives and counter spaces, and I love that. And I do think that psychologists um, can play a critical role in understanding, creating, cultivating counter spaces and narratives that affirm, validate our humanity, as well as to name and challenge oppression. Um, and how to have both of these when we think we want to have the spotlight on Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, we want to be able to name oppression, but we also want to highlight the fact that our lives exist without, is not just dependent, that's not all who our lives are, and how do you hold all of those um, and I, you know, reminded of the work that Toni Morrison does or Zora Neale Hurston, where they write stories for Black people. So how do we use a psychology to write stories for us that takes all of this into consideration? And so you talk about this beautiful narrative about Mason, Tennessee. So if we were to write counter spaces, they are stories, what would they be? What would they tell us that both affirm and challenge? Um, I really, again, love this. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Luke, for this gift. It was an incredibly stimulating presentation. Um, you've, got, you've given me a lot to think about and to ponder. Um, you've done a beautiful job of really thinking about um, building a psychology model that is informed by interdisciplinary scholarship, centering the uh, writings and thinkings of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, I just can't wait for other folks to engage this, to read the JCP article and get this book um, that you've written. And so thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for those, those comments. It's lovely. And I really appreciate it. It's, um, um, I'm looking forward to our book as well. We, we actually just had another extension for the deadline because we just, there's so much to, that we keep moving into it that, um, that uh, we're, we're hoping to get that done uh, soon enough. But I, I just want to thank you for those lovely comments and just so nurturing, so thoughtful. And um, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. You've given us such richness to to work with and think with tonight. Uh, we've got another 20 minutes or so, and uh, there has been a lot of, as Dr. Neville, you requested a lot of love thrown into the chat, a lot of affirmations, of just how powerful this was for people. Uh, some people are using language such as you've given us some connective tissue to actually put language to things we don't often have language for, and that this is so useful and powerful and important. So thank you for that. So I want to encourage the audience to keep throwing things in Q&A.
I'm going to do my best to try to get a smattering of questions from different types of audience members, students, and so forth, so that we can bring some of that to you. So I'm going to going to throw some things out there. Feel free to take them up, and uh, we'll see how many questions we can we can put to you tonight. So um, I think one thing I'm seeing over and over is a desire for there to be a little bit more explication of your understanding of white time. This is a, a concept that's clearly interesting to people. So um, actually a faculty member here at BC is asking, can you explain a little bit more in terms of a definition you'd give to what white time is and how it's working? How does white time differ from, um, sorry, the questions are really coming in, so it's moving it all around, mm -hmm. um, differ from time as conceived and operated on by people membered into other racialized groups? And why is this important when thinking about systemic racism? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll try to answer this uh, succinctly. I, I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but um, so in in a lot of the literature, and this is sort of reading a lot of the experiences of scholars of color, writers of color, artists of color, one of the things, and, and sociologists as well, and, and people from outside of psychology, one of the things that was very apparent in, in terms of the description of racism and the experience of racism, but also how racism operates, is that there's uh, either explicit or a very subtle component related to time as a function within systemic racism. And so, and what's interesting too is um, when I went to Bronfenbrenner's model to try to understand this a little bit more, Bronfenbrenner puts the quantum system at the very outside of it, right? And it and it simply is a function of marking things that are happening. It it doesn't and, and uh, it doesn't really represent anything that is uh, creates any conflict or creates any tension. And so therefore it's outside of that person's uh, experience. But for many people of color, I think uh, time historically, contemporarily has been used as a form of uh, aggression. So as an example, um, one of the things I talk about or we talk about is the idea of time theft and time theft can be multitude of different ways that time is constantly stolen from us as people of color. It can be slight delays. It could be losing, um, uh, not being able to be present when you're doing something with, uh, with, you're not being able to be present. So for instance, uh, for many people of color, we're very aware that when we go into a restaurant, for instance, who's being served around us, right? The, and the moment that we start to see the inequities that are happening, we're pulled out of the present moment and we're suddenly gauging everything that's going on. I, I, I call that a kind of time theft because we're not able to enjoy the moment with our loved one or loved ones at that moment. Instead, we're contending with this, what we are perceiving and experiencing as a form of racism. So that's an example of time theft. It can be delays, it can be things like being asked for extra identification, all those kinds of things that are forms of time theft. Allochronism is much more subtle, much more general. Allochronism, as Dr. Neville was talking about, functions at sort of this, um, uh, larger societal level, belief system level. And uh, what that is simply is uh, the belief that Black and non-Black people of color and communities of color are uh, simply less evolved, that they're not, they're, it's a form of dehumanization or infrahumanization that um, at a very practical level is so pervasive that the way it comes out, and I, I identified that in the slides, is that um, they're perceived as less intelligent, right? Or, or uh, and or they're also seen as um, uh, more tolerant to things like pain, right? Or they don't feel human emotions. And you think that that seems absurd, but we know from uh, research around uh, medical practices, right? If you go into the physician's office or trying to seek treatment, uh, one of the things that's a constant complaint is that uh, physicians often don't, white physicians often don't um, pay attention to the reports of black uh, and non-black people of color patients in those situations. And in fact, they get better treatment when they're being seen by a physician of color than they are being, than they're seen, being seen by a, a white physician. So allochronism functions as this kind of idea that they're less evolved, um, less intelligent. Uh, they don't have this sort of emotional capacity of humans at a practical level, like I identified uh, in the slides. Um, 
black and non-black kids of color are seen as too big, too aggressive, too sexual, uh, less intelligent uh, when compared to white kids of their same age. And so that's a form of allochronism. It's sort of this idea that people of color exist on a deviant time frame, a different kind of time frame. And the holders of real time are white people, right? That they determine what is appropriate time, what is accurate time, what's a good developmental time. And that's, that's sort of what allochronism um, uh, kind of means uh, within, the, within the paper. I, I don't know if uh, Helen if you had, or Dr. Neville, if you had, sorry, had any thoughts about what I presented. No, I, I think that um, to me makes a lot of sense. And I'm, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I'll just say in our um, one of the things that um, one of the things that uh, is still very apparent in the psychological research, um, especially uh, when researchers are producing um, papers that are focused on things like genetic differences on intelligence, it's still being produced. Right? There's a paper by Weiner, 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 and, and somebody else that came out in the. Uh, personality social psychology, I think that focus on uh, intelligence differences. And you can see throughout, if you really have this lens of allochronism, and this idea that um, black and non-black people are less developmentally evolved, it's pervasive. It's, it's the thing that they build their entire paper on that uh, white people are more evolved and black and non-black people of color are less evolved. And that's how they make their arguments around genetic differences in uh, intelligence, for instance, as an example. So I'll stop Thank there. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, moving to, to an undergraduate student's question, very mm -hmm. earnest in nature. Uh, what are things as a young college student I can do to uplift communities that are affected by systemic racism? Excellent question. What can you do? <laughs> That's, that always is a, that always, um, I there, well, there, there are a lot of approaches that you can take. If you take this racial spatial framework and trying to figure out what you, what you can do as a, as a, I, I assume maybe as a white uh, college student for communities of color is to um, use it as a way to understand uh, things that are happening in the physical space within your community, right? That they, that, that is a form of uh, spatial, spatially based racism. Um, and to think, and to elevate, to collaborate, to collude, to work with communities of color, um, in ways that can disrupt, uh, to identify ways that they're being dislocated, uh, to participate in movements, to speak up, um, to and to highlight uh, um, the degradation that's happening in a lot of these communities of color. And I think the other piece too, I just wanna uh, also offer is that when we think about uh, racism, when we think about the operations of systemic racism, um, one of the conclusions that my co-authors and I came to is this idea that, you know, racism still has a function, has, still has as a, as a primary function, this notion of control. Uh, not only control, but it also has a very annihilative component to it. And we can't ever turn our eyes away from it. We, we have to be able to sit with the, um, the uh, perniciousness, the deadliness of racism, either as an immediate cause or as a long-term cause through chronic stress and other metabolic effects. But we really have to be able to sit with this notion of racism as having these, these very severe detrimental effects that it is interpersonal, but it is also metabolic. It is also systemic, it's also cultural. Um, and then we have to sort of be able to understand uh, how pernicious racism, systemic racism is. Can I just, um, may I say, oh, I, um, in addition to everything that Dr. Liu said, um, I also think um, 
that if I'm not sure of the identity of the person. So if the assumption of the person who wrote the question is white, I, I, I'm not sure, I don't know if uplifting people of color is really the first kind of step. The kind of step is to really begin to interrogate um, your own whiteness if the person is white and how these things that Dr. Liu has outlined, how's that work in yourself? Where do you see it in your family, in your neighborhood? Begin to use these tools to gain a critical awareness and then begin to challenge whiteness, anti-blackness in the circles that you are working in um, begin to look at structural changes that Dr. Lewis uh, has talked about using resources there. I think that could also be um, a really good strategy. So you might want to think about the college campus that you're currently on and using the tools and this model that was presented to see how that applies on your campus. Um, so just thank you. Well, a question that piggybacks a little bit on this, um, instead of it being about uh, sort of communities we imagine are being affected by systemic racism, this is particular to the counseling field. How, how do you suggest we dismantle these systems of power within the counseling field and then also within academia? Big questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um... So uh, one of the things that we put into the JCP paper was this, uh, um, and uh, Dr. Neville is talking about this in terms of the counter narratives and uh, counter spaces. Um, it leads us to this, it leads us to this idea of thinking about the ways that we practice potentially and the ways that we approach health, wellness, and how we identify and conceptualize illness, for instance, within our current uh, theoretical frameworks. And this comes from the work of um, <clears throat> Charles Mills, where he, where he talked about sort of philosophically this idea of um, white epistemological ignorance. And it's not, and it, there's one way to understand it, but what he was also arguing uh, in terms of white epistemological ignorance was this idea that um, the, these white philosophers who talked about freedom, talked about liberation, um, were developing these models and theories of liberation and freedom, all the while they were, all the while, um, all of this horrendous racism was happening around them, but they didn't attend to it. In fact, they taught, they talked about it as they're not worthy of our attention. So, this, so they developed this theory of, uh, of freedom and liberation, um, all the while ignoring this horrendous racism that was happening. So how do we understand what, within our current field? Um, you know, with, within our current uh, psychological frameworks of dynamic, humanistic, existential, um, uh, cognitive behavioral, for instance, uh, these are theoretical frameworks that were developed um, that didn't talk to, didn't centralize race and racism. So one of the questions that we put into the paper was, can you treat the effects of racism if you never centered racism, right? And it goes back to sort of what we, what I started with in terms of talking about Bronk from Brenner's model. If you never centralize race and racism, um, then who are you centralizing? Who are you putting at the center of, of what you identify as health and wellness? Um, and so it causes us, it starts to make us think about, you know, are, are our current psychological systems appropriate in treating the, the trauma and the effects of racism in the lives of people of color? And to some extent it's, we can, right, to some, to some extent. But um, there are also all these other ways of approaching health and wellness that centralize, center, center race, center the lives of Black and non-Black people of color as a model and as a way to um, uh, talk about health and wellness, yet those are marginal theories. They're not central, right? 
in our in our courses we still teach these specific theories of really old dead white guys and uh, we keep perpetuating this particular model keep making those theories relevant of bringing it to the current day through these adaptive systems such as multicultural competencies multicultural uh, cultural humility that adapt these theoretical systems to the current day and what i'm suggesting is if we're really thinking about um decolonizing being anti-racist um what is it that we want to do you know, how do we how do we decolonize a theory that's premised on this rigid epistemological ignorance of when they built the model of, of health and wellness ignored all of these things that were happening all around them so i just I, i'll stop there i feel like i've said a bunch we have a couple questions that have to do with wondering about uh, how this model plays and exists outside of the US context um, with, with the emphasis on sort of whiteness, anti-blackness, wondering about additional layers that would be brought about looking sort of with the globalizing model and curious if you have ideas as, as you sort of form this about its applicability and ability to sort of move into those other layers as well. Um, I, I would say um, before we move to a context to understand how this applies outside, let's sit with it and try to understand how it operates within our current context, right? Um, it, white supremacy, racial capitalism as a global matter, anti-Blackness is a global matter. These are global effects, right? This system is informed by global literatures, but I was trying to build a framework that really tried to understand systemic racism within the US context. And I know it's we want to see it applied to these global contexts and start to sort of pick it apart. But one of the things that happens quite frequently when uh, we, we talk about these matters is we want to do this sort of cultural or racial comparison outside of the US context. And I'm saying there's so much that's happening for us here in the US that let's just sit with it for a moment and try to understand what's happening here before we dash off and try to make a comparative comparison outside of the US context. Because this, because we, we barely have an understanding of what these effects are for us here in the domestic sense, in the continent, continental US. Let's try to understand it first here before we start to build out um, globally. But I, what I'll say is that the certainly I read, you know, we read uh, global literature, right, from experiences of people of color um, and try to apply it into the U.S. context. That makes that makes great sense. And thank you for continuing to ground us in you know, mm -hmm. what could be described as sort of the local so that we can get that right deep, deep in our roots in, in that capacity before trying to, to, you know, derive generalizable theories and universalizing principles. So I think that's really helpful. Um, this next question I'm, I'm sort of bringing to you in part because I'm reading all of these questions coming from the many mental health counseling students and mm -hmm. counseling doctoral students that are here in the program and also faculty from these programs. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you were to wave a magic wand and be able to transform how the future generation of clinicians are being trained, what would be some things you would want to see in the curriculum and classes to help ensure that these these sensibilities are brought to the fore and that the next generation of clinicians and of the field of psychology can contend with this with the equipment necessary. May, may I give some space to Dr. Neville? See if, I'd like to see if, Helen, if you have thoughts about that question. Um, sure. Um, thanks. Magic wand is in your hands. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's such an important question. I think that then we'd have to think about how we could radically, radically de um, decolonize our um, curriculum and training spaces and things that 
dovetail into what Will has talked about and some of the things that I've been thinking through with uh, a variety of different people is how then do you go against um, this um, racialized capitalist view of productivity output output and how do you then invest in um, the humanity of our students, of our colleagues, of who. So we're going to have to radically change how we even do things, how we connect um, with human beings, um, how we see one another. And so I think a piece of it is for us to do some internal work, um, healing of ourselves first, as Bell Hooks talks about do a lot of that internal work, seeing where inner, um, uh, injuries come from and our trauma. So when we come together, we can show up, we can explore our stuff, um, and we can create these spaces of healing that acknowledge um, how structural racism and racial capitalism and anti-Blackness and white supremacy show up in society, how it's replicated in um, our training program, how it's replicated in the policies in terms of who we admit, how we admit people, how it's replicated in our curriculum. I love the way that Dr. Liu had talked about, how are we teaching things? I know that, um, Division 17 of APA, the Society of Counseling Psychology, has a whole program on decolonizing their curriculum, which is great, which is going to provide us some tools to think about it. How do we start off with some of the, um, the um, works that Dr. Liu has cited, the theory, so that we can decenter? Um, so that we can, I'm sorry, center the work of uh, folks of color and the theories and how they're thinking about well-being and heal and healing and how they're thinking about justice. Um, we need to really think about how mental health is, um, it's a privilege to be able to provide individual therapy for folks. And I think that is important, but I also think that is not the only form of therapy. And how is it that we can touch into and tap into other forms of therapy that we can then begin to address um, mental health inequalities, that we can do things in a culturally relevant way, et cetera. Other quick things are um, how do we, and, and uh, Dr. Liu talks about this and other folks do too, how do we um, think about what we study, why we study what we study, what's important? How do we center the people most impacted by our work? They're not, I don't want to hear about what I want or what you want. I want to hear about who wants to come into therapy. Who, who are the people at Mason? What do they need from us? What are our tools? How do we then center community voices so that we can begin to address their specific needs and then bring them into our training sites as experts paying them um, so that there's much more of an exchange and openness um, to some ideas. I got a lot of other things I could, I'd be talking here until, uh, uh, till our time is up, but those are just some things. You can see I'm really excited and, um, I'll throw it back to Dr. Liu. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I, I completely agree. I, I, I think, um, you, you know, when we think about training, um, uh, especially with the communities that we want to work with, we need to think about who are we, um, accountable to. Right, and that's an important piece. Is the communities, the the writing in this latter part of my career that I'm doing, you know, I've, uh, that I've recognized for myself is that, you know, you start to change the audience that you're writing to, you know, and as soon as you start to make, and for, for those of you who are young scholars who are doing it, as soon as you start to make that sort of epistemological shift and that start, you start to change it to think, I'm in this example here, um, I'm being held accountable accountable by Dr. Neville, right? I want to make sure that I am saying and doing the things that are representative of our experience of what is important. And as a colleague and as a friend, as somebody who's a uh, uh, dear expert in the field, um, that, that becomes an important um, part of how we want to start to shift our our epistemology, right? Who do we want to, who are we, who is our community and who do we want to be held accountable to? And then it helps us start to take a different approach and different look at the things that we're being trained into and what the, what they're being asked or what we're being asked to do. 
uh, and all the things that we're being asked to accommodate as a result of it, right? Um, and the ways that we're, we adapt ourselves to try to make it relevant, constantly relevant to these communities of color, when in fact, we have this wealth of theories and experiences and writings that are healing, but are considered not core material in our training. And that, and as uh, Dr. Neville is talking about, I mean, those are the kind of things that we need to bring more into this, more into our uh, the center if we want to think about ourselves as relevant cultural um, uh, mental health practitioners um, with our diverse communities. Dr. Liu, Dr. Neville, the the amount of the outpouring of of appreciation in the Q and A area is is vast, and I look forward to sending along those comments to you so you can bask in them after. Um, but. I just have to thank you so much. As an inaugural lecture out of the Institute for the Study of Race and Culture, this could not have gone better and it was such a success. And we so appreciate your time, your wisdom, your energy. And to the audience, thank you for being here with us tonight. And may this work challenge you and uh, bring you out into the world um, with these eyes and, uh, and with, it, with a deeper way of thinking about and acting in this, in this domain. So thank you all, have a lovely night and be well. Thank you. Good night all.